today we are um, going to embark on a conversation that I think is going to be really cool. Um, Cornell University Secret Sauce for Higher Ed Marketing and um, with Ashley Budd, who we're going to bring on just momentarily. So thanks for being here for this, especially the day after a holiday. Mike, why are we doing today's episode? Um, why are we doing today's episode? Well, I don't want to spoil what um, the secret sauce is, but Ashley Budd is one of the most gifted marketers in higher education. Um, you can find all sorts of her content on ashleybudd.com. I'd recommend signing up for a newsletter um, as well. It is probably one of the most um, voluminous newsletters, but in a way that is still accessible with lots of actionable items. So uh, I'm uh, somebody who signed up for it. Um, Greg, are you signed up for it yet? I am. Before Good. we bring Ashley out real quick, I just want to remind everyone, have your questions loaded. Use the chat for your questions. If you want to come on and answer a question, just put it in the chat and Lexi will bring you in at the appropriate time. I always forget to do that. I'm so sorry. So stay muted until you're called upon. Um, this episode of FYI, of course, brought to you by Mongoose. Um, we are makers of Higher Ed's premier engagement platform, Cadence. And we're super excited for this one. So I, I, I always forget about that microphone muting thing and I wanted to bring that on. With that being said, and it was such a terrible lead in for such a wonderful guest. Um, we wanna bring on uh, Ashley to say hi to everyone and tell a little bit about yourself. Ashley, thanks for joining us. Hi everyone. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be back in my office. Um, I've been out of my office for a couple of weeks and um, you can see if you're you can look at my screen how sad my plant <laughs> life is from leaving my office um, but it's good to be back and talking about marketing with you all um, I have been at Cornell for almost 10 years which is crazy um, uh, and I've been in a few different roles but all within their advancement division um, I started as a social media strategist in 2013 um, and our team kind of quickly evolved into a social from a social media strategy team to a digital innovation group when we started onboarding new uh, communication technologies, um, things like crowdfunding, um, doing Cornell's first giving day, um, and we were starting to move out of just the social media space, which Cornell advancement was really far ahead on uh, when I joined that team in 2013. I was the third full-time social media strategist just with an advancement. Um, I, I don't think there are teams of social media strategists that big um, at many places, let alone in an alumni and development unit. Um, we don't have three full-time people doing social for Cornell alumni anymore. Um, that has evolved with the innovation path that we're on, but um, just kind of gives you a sense of how, um, how much investment they put into digital communication. And um, so started as a strategist, um, I moved, I'm a remote employee and I've been remote since 2014. Um, so I've got this um, remote OG thing going on for myself. Um, and then um, I am currently the director of marketing operations for uh -huh. advancement in, uh, at Cornell. Um, and so I oversee all of the alumni communication, um, that are is for the broad base um so all of our alumni and um the broad base of donors think about like all the signature events that will happen at the university like reunion and homecoming and those big things that involve alumni um but our group is also responsible for broad-based giving um so all the gifts that are under a thousand dollars um we're we're responsible for that participation strategy too um and the marketing operations team, um, uh, it's only two years old. Um, we're a, a relatively new mini org within this bigger massive org. Um, and uh, we, um, well, I'm gonna share, I guess when we get into the questions a lot more about um, how we get the work done, but sometimes I like lovingly will refer to marketing operations as the factory. Um, uh, or an internal agency. I think it's kind of more fun to use a factory analogy because we create a lot of the content um, and then we also ship it on all the different platforms. So direct mail, text messaging, email, social media, um, that's, that's the unit that I oversee. 
that we are going to have something for everyone on this one. I can tell just from that background alone. That's awesome. Mike, um, before we get into our first question, just adjust the view um, as per speaker view. Um, and uh, let's get into uh, the conversation with Ashley. This is, this is awesome. And don't forget, get your questions loaded for the chat. We are going to get to Q&A a little bit later in this conversation. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so uh, first off, um, you know, Ashley, let's not keep the people waiting. What is the secret sauce? <laughs> yeah, well, um, the secret is um, it really in our writing style and how effective our communication is. Um, and we have moved from um, kind of this like formal writing style that you find at a lot of institutions, not just Ivy League institutions, but a lot of academic institutions. Um, from a formal kind of writing style where a writer would sit down and craft something and send it out um, to be read um, and it's read and then it's done um, to a more conversational writing style. And so I would say that our, our secret sauce is a conversational design or a conversational um, voice and tone where uh, in even the things that you think would be something that you would write and leave for someone to absorb and move on, um, that instead we're inviting a conversation in all of the writing that we're doing. And um, this uh, approach is engaging, um, but it's also uh, really effective in uh, helping to make your communication feel personal. And one of the things that we um, for years have been trying to tackle uh, from a digital strategy perspective is how do we personalize communication? How can we make things more personal? Um, from the days that I started, you know, we were talking about, well, Amazon and Netflix can do this, right? Like, how do we, how do we personalize? How do we personalize? And we know we're not Amazon or Netflix. Um, and we've really found that you don't need to be a tech behemoth. Um, you don't need to have all of the data to do hyper variable messaging, personalized messaging to have a personal conversation with a person to make it sound like it's personal. Um, and so that has been our secret and I'm excited to share how we like are putting that into action. It is interesting. So and I think whether someone's a writer or not, if you give them a task to write, they'll think about what they were taught in seventh grade English, you know, dear sir, sir or madam. So I think the tendency is always to follow that template in some people's yeah. rest of your life. So I'd ask you, um, when did you first get turned on to conversational marketing and realize that there's a different way to reach people that doesn't have to stay inside of that template? When did you learn to color, color out of the lines, I guess? Yeah, um, so we did a web redesign project um, started in 2015 and we shipped the new site um, right around early 2017. And we worked with a fantastic group in San Francisco called Mule Design. Um, and our lead strategist on the project is Erica Hall. Um, Erica Hall is my professional spirit animal. Um, she's amazing. She wrote the book that's on my desk. Um, just enough research one of these nice uh, book apart chap books just enough research um and then she was writing uh, while we worked together she was writing a book called conversational design and so we did a um a writing workshop with erica where she started laying out in such a logical way why a conversational voice and tone was going to be a critical part of the way we wrote all of our web copy. Um, and it's so logical that we started um, implementing it in, in, in all of our writing styles across all of our, our different platforms. Um, and another thing that I'll share is um, I mentioned that our marketing operations team is only two years old. Um, that team came out of a merger of three different communication teams. Um, the digital team that I was on, a annual giving marketing team and a branded communication team that existed with an advancement. 
And when we merged those teams, we put one person in charge of messaging. And that one person is maintains the voice. Um, and that really helped us logistically start having that same conversational voice and tone across all of our messages because we had someone, one person who the same person who was responsible for the messaging for reunion is now responsible for the solicitation copy. Um, and so we were able to have the kind of control that we needed um, to start this conversation with people, um, maybe in an engagement communication, and then finish the conversation with them um, while we're stewarding them after, after gifts. And so, um, so that was also, I think, uh, part of the awakening <laughs> of how um, a conversational voice, how, how, how we can put a, make a conversation with folks and how we can think about instead of just, we're going to send this, we're going to tell people to save the date for something. Uh, how can we start the conversation with this group? Um, that can be for... difficult for other um, people to follow that. Like, that's great. Mm -hmm. You get one person that really has that voice captured. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say for schools that don't have that type of control, um, would a brand guide suit that? Like, how do you, um, how do you tackle that for a yeah. team of people that have to write? Yeah, yeah, and um, and you're exactly right. The the style guide or what I'll uh, in individual campaigns we call them messaging frameworks. But it's between a messaging framework and a style guide that many people can use, um, that's what we point to. Um, and so in our writing style guide, not a visual style guide, a style guide for writing, um, we we talk about this conversational voice and point of view. Um, and we'll also hold training sessions um, at least a couple times a year for staff members to learn how how to use our how to use the style guide, but how to also write in that conversational voice and tone. Very good. Are what are the the parameters or I guess the guardrails you have up on that conversational so it doesn't get too off kilter or too informal? Um, oh, well, I think people will be surprised at how informal our writing is. <laughs> um, and I think the guidelines are, um, you know, we, we tell people to write how they speak. Um, and um, I think I'm trying to think of how to guide you on this. Um, authenticity is one of our, our pillars. Um, and that means um, trying to show that we are people and that we have emotions and that we have points of view and that we can make jokes. And um, as long as it is real, then kind of anything goes. Um, so, uh, one example from just this past week, um, we sent out a end of year, we just finished our end of year. Uh, we wanted to get a quick communication out to all donors, thanking them and reporting back on what we did um, in the previous year. And we have a capital campaign right now where the tagline is to do the greatest good. Um, our subject line for that stewardship email was you did good this year, Ashley. And from like a formal writer, like if you had your formal writer hat on, no way does that subject line get sent out <laughs> from Cornell University. I saw some people nodding their head. Yeah, like they're like, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but if you were a part of, if you understood what doing good meant mm -hmm. in our co campaign context, if you understood our voice and tone, um, you would know that that was that we knew what we were doing mm -hmm. when we wrote that subject line. So um, it it really does make formally trained writers uncomfortable. The way we I write. love it, I, I love taking chances, and I'm I'm probably obsessed about it. By the way, Mike, authenticity was mentioned again. Everyone, do a shot. No, um, every episode we have it's to like say Pee Wee the Herman. They're like, ah, magic word. <laughs> but it's super yeah. important. But um, I, I love. Uh, uh, conversational tone and subject lines. And I guess I would ask you to respond to this, Ashley, but also to have the audience think about this. 
we are in such competition in, in a higher ed span to like compete with all these other emails and texts that are going out to people. So mm -hmm. it, it, you almost have to um, take chances with it and, you know, stay, um, you know, decent and professional, but just taking chances. Just talk about like how you told that line at Cornell. Um, and I love that you're coming from like an institution that's, you know, well recognized. They obviously have a, uh, a reputation that you have to abide by, but how do you toe that line or balance like taking a chance, but also getting people's attention? Yeah, I guess we wouldn't, uh, The we try to get people's attention. Yeah, that, that's true. I think, so there's authenticity is one of the three pillars I talk about in, um, in effective email communication and really it goes for effectiveness and trust building anywhere. Um, this triangle that we use, this trust triangle. And we try to build trust as much as we can with our audience so that they know if we're gonna send them a communication, it's worth their time. Um, they can trust us that the information's good, that it's the information that they want and it's on the channel that they want. And so authenticity is a big part of that. It's the top of the pyramid for me. Um, and that is being honest in what you're writing, showing that you're human, showing that emotion. And we use emoji a lot um, to help convey emotion. Um, uh, the next is empathy. So the other end of your triangle uh, being empathy. And the way we think about empathy is um, we want our audience to know that we're we're sending the communication to be helpful to them, um, that we want them to succeed. Um, and so whatever it is, it's, um, we want you to know a date ahead of time so that you can plan. We um, want to offer you a giving opportunity that matches your philanthropic interest. Uh, you know, the empathy part is, um, you know, we're here to put a smile on your face today. We want you to have a good day. Um, so that's part of building trust that they know that when we're sending something to them that it's because we believe they want it um, and that it can be helpful in a lot of ways. And then the last piece, so authenticity, empathy, and then the last piece is logic. Um, is it logical? Like, why am I, should they, they shouldn't be asking why am I getting this communication or how, how do I take action next? Making things really easy, making sure that they can follow our logic. Um, and so, um, if all of those things are there, then we have a really strong, we've built a, a strong trusting relationship with our audience and they can trust us to, um, to surprise them. <laughs> they can trust us to see a subject line that makes them go, huh? Um, because there's, there's a little bit more to it um, when they unpack uh, what the communication is. So um, th those those three things help guide a lot of our decisions on, you know, are we doing it as a gimmick? Um, that's okay. Like I can, we can talk about clickbait all day. I love, I love gimmicks. Um, but if, um, if the gimmick is there serving a purpose, um, a lot of times our gimmicks are just to make people smile. Um, because if we can relate opening one of our communications and putting a smile on their face, the chances that they will continue to open our communications are really high. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, other, you know, other things that you'll see in our style guide are um, I, I mentioned using a emo using emoji for emotion. We feel really strongly about that from um, not just. Uh, um, not just a stylistic point of view, but um, also to help convey communication more effectively. Um, using emojis in our headers help people kind of skim information quicker. Um, it helps people have a lighter cognitive load when they're trying to understand what we're telling them. Um, you know, it can help it, if we're trying to make a joke. Um, it can help make it clear that we're making a joke if we're using an emoji that reflects that. Um, but it can help like reemphasize what we're trying to say, um, and also helps people kind of skim for information and highlight things that we really want them to see.
the metrics on emojis are amazing. Like the response yes. that you get when you use them. I mean, just a little telephone and a subject line, people automatically know you're talking about maybe a phonathon or a little video, you yeah. know, that they're about to watch a video. It's amazing what yeah. one little emoji can do. Yeah, it scares me when institutions tell us they won't use uh, emojis. I know there's a few I work with and I'm always like, oh, you're missing out on opportunities, but uh, good. Um, I had a quick question for you, Ashley. So uh, I put out um, the link to alumni.cornell.edu because I am in love with your website. Um, I love the design. Um, it seems like when I look at most alumni pages, there's a very distinctive give now, um, or, you know, these are alumni we want to recognize with their stories. And there's certainly a giving link and you'll see it on the side, but um, what, can you talk about snack bar and where that came from? Cause I love that. Yes. Um, so this, this website's amazing. Like I mentioned, we work with mule design to pull it all together and it was stood up in 2017 and we have not had to make many changes. And if you can have a website living and breathing that long without many changes, you know, they've, they've hit it, hit the nail on the head. So, um, can't give enough props to mule. Um, I do think we were one of their last web design customers um, before um, Erica and Mike decided to go write more books. Um, so if you're writing them down for your next RFP, I'm not sure that they will show up. Um, but uh, uh, the snack bar is, um, the snack bar is interesting. So prior to um, this web redesign, we didn't have a a place of our own for alumni storytelling. It happened at the Central University web properties. We found that there were sometimes things that did not need a full length news article um, and um, that there were a lot of things that our college and unit partners or alumni themselves wanted us to promote. Um, there was also just like a ton of really awesome content coming out of Cornell. And so um, we saw the snack bar as a place to deliver like tiny social sized snippets um, rather than long form storytelling. And we thought of all the different kinds of snippets that we might share. We might wanna share quotes. We might wanna share photos. We might wanna share social posts. We might wanna share data points. Um, and so you see all of those different content types reflected there. Uh, if you were on our campaign website, uh, which is greatestgood.cornell.edu, um, we rebooted the snack bar idea there as well um, in a section called good stories. And so um, these content types are super, super helpful for us just to be able to communicate quickly that this is a thing that we're connected to um, and we think it should it would be interesting to you. So. Um, it acts similar to a social feed, I guess, in the way an audience member would behavior, behave with it. Um, it's in chronological order of when we post things, um, but it's ours to control, right? And it's, our own, and it's in our own environment. And so um, this, these are snippets that we will share in email communication and push people to our website. Um, there are also, um, it, there's also a, a pretty strong cohort of people that have now are now in the habit of just checking in on the snack bar and seeing what we're posting and and so that's a good thing most of our traffic though is is from us pushing uh folks and again mike mike put that uh, link in the chat uh while you're there just to remind you um definitely sign up for uh, ashley's newsletter um you have her here though for direct questions that can um really um uh be customizable to your school and your unique situation. So I would take advantage of that. Um, use the chat to ask a question. If you'd like to come on, you can do that as well. So just a reminder, um, we are going to be getting to questions very shortly, but I believe Mike has another one before that. I do. So um, it's interesting. You said your website was designed in 2017, haven't had to make many changes. Um, there's this big like global event that happened like you know, two years ago uh, in COVID. And it seemed like every school was, uh, was really pivoting and transitioning and trying to be more digital. Did, did that have an effect on, on really what you were doing? Or did you find you were you set up for something like that happening theoretically? Um, we were really well positioned to operate digital first. Um, 
and that's because of the investment that was put into the alumni affairs organization um, as early as 2009 at Cornell. Um, so we had already been doing hybrid and live streamed events prior to COVID. Um, we already had a sophisticated email communication um, program, not necessarily in the tool set, but in how we organized ourselves, um, how we use a shared calendar, um, how we shared resources. Um, so we were well positioned um, and we leveraged um, the moment to streamline communications even more. Um, so one of the strategic things we did with the email calendar, um, because of the phenomenon that happened with uh, an organization like ours, where lots of the programming was happening regionally. So there were events happening, you know, all over the world. And now all of a sudden, all of those regional events are happening in one space, the internet. Um, and now they can be communicated to everyone all the time. And so we saw this as an opportunity to stop um, it, I guess we didn't stop things. Things kind of stopped naturally. We used it as an opportunity to streamline and we um, picked two days a week that we were going to send an all alumni communication. And since April of 2020, Cornell alumni have been getting two emails at least. <laughs> Um, two emails from the university, from my team. Uh, every Tuesday, they get a newsletter. And every Thursday, they get a single call to action email from us. Um, and that streamlining helped us create a kind of um, a, a regular cadence of communication. Um, and the consistency of that really helped our engagement efforts, um, particularly in email, but with email being our biggest driver conversion on events and online giving, it was an important channel uh, to tackle. So um, we found with increasing the amount of all alumni emails that we sent, um, everything else increased, open rates mm. increased, click rates increased. Um, and it was the consistency of it um, that really helped. Um, and where the streamlining came in is, like I said, I didn't tell people to stop, um, but we told people to stop sending on those two days. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that was the only communication that was going out because it was going to everyone. Um, and then it let all the other program areas kind of find their way either um, so many of them moved to weekend communication and found really great success instead of sending something on the weekday, moving it to a weekend. Um, and then others um, found that they could just give us their content to share in the newsletter and they didn't need to then have their own um, email that was going out that week. So that's actually where we were able to lessen the volume um, of individual individual marketing communications by uh, having this newsletter go out much more frequently. Um, so that was a, that was a, that was probably the biggest move for us um, was really cranking up the amount of all alumni communication that we had. Um, and when we did that, everything else rose. Disagree with me if you would. Um, I would say though, um, if you're um, on our, um, uh, our series today watching, um, thank you. Um, that doesn't mean send an email every single day and all of your open rates. Like there has to be that combination that Ashley's talking about where they have to be interesting emails or they have to be, you know, personalized. They have to be good emails. People have to like them. And then sending more emails would equal to more open rates, like the familiarity with them. Am I misspeaking there? Do you think that's like that? that I think that in combination of good emails and more emails is important, not just more emails, right? Yes, quality is one of like one of the most important things. And if we don't have content to go out on a Thursday for that single call to action email, we don't force it. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have in our newsletter, you know, we have to have six boxes and they all have to be filled in. If there's nothing for the six box, don't force it because again, we're trying to be helpful. This is the empathy part that I think is really important. Um, and how empathy is tied to quality, someone, I'm taking someone's time away from them for, for them to read an email from me. 
And in the grand scheme of things happening in a person's life, the university is teeny, teeny, tiny, right? So um, making sure that if we're going to send a communication and take that time away from someone, that it, we know that it's going to be worth their time. Um, so quality, yes, absolutely. But I do have to say, like on a technical standpoint, um, this is specific to email communication, but um, your sender reputation is tied to frequency. Um, and so if you are only sending a communication to your audience once a month or less, um, your sender reputation is not going to be as strong as if you had multiple touch points to an audience within a month, um, because your email service providers, the big folks are doing a reputation review on a monthly basis. Um, and a lot, what happened during COVID for a lot of institutions was that they pulled back and they said, oh, we don't want to bug people. They said, we got to stop. Let's not communicate with them. We got to pull back. They, they don't need to hear from us. And that tanked reputation, sender reputations um, because the communication stopped and then you had to build your reputation back up again. Um, and so instead, maybe it's changing the communication to that group, leaning into the empathy. What do they need from us right now? How do we fit into their life? Um, but don't pull back. Um, and I think so many people saw that when they did pull back, they lost a lot of ground, a lot of ground on engagement and giving. Um, but also it takes, it, it's going to take time to build up um, just even from a technical standpoint to get yourself out of junk or promotions and back in the inbox. Um, so, um, so yes, quality is important, but frequency is really important too. Um, and I don't think we've yet, so we're doing two all alumni emails um, a week. Um, there's other emails that people get and the more engaged you are with the institution, the more email you're gonna get from different units. Um, but I still haven't seen the threshold for email pain um, hit yet. Um, and I look at the unsubscribe rate really as our, our primary indicator of when we've gone too far in terms of volume. And we haven't hit that yet. Um, if you think about the brands that you're most connected to, or not maybe not even the brands that you love the most, but the ones you let flood your inbox the most, um, there are some that are like Amazon will send me six emails a day. Um, and I'm not unsubscribing from Amazon because there might be one of those six emails that I really need. Um, so, you know, there's a, it, it, there's a consideration there with, you know, how, how much value can your brand provide? Um, and I think, I think there's a correlation with how much volume you can do. I love it. Um, I love that answer. Um, and I don't think I know everything at all, but I love, um, you know, that you have the results to back up what you're saying, but also it's different than what I thought. That's, I kind of cool. just love that when that happens. And yeah. the questions are pouring in. in. One of them is one of my favorite questions ever, but I don't think it's the first one. So we're gonna get, let Lexi get to the questions um, because people want answers. So go ahead, Lexi. Yeah, our first question comes from Stephanie. They ask, how do you get leadership to understand conversational writing as opposed to formal writing? That's a question I get every time I speak. Um, the, this is like kind of a joking answer, but you, I think one that is effective for some leadership is to say Cornell's doing it, um, and they're seeing results. Um, there is a lot of great documentation about plain language. So, um, and that, you know, like another quick Google away, um, looking for resources that uh, point to playing language and its ties to accessibility. Um, accessibility in terms of um, all of the constituencies that you have. Yes, it, you know, for me, my, my primary audience has graduated with a college degree, but that doesn't mean that they need to sit down and read college level reading. Uh, um, writing in their communication from us because it takes more time to process. Um, and it's not even like using big words. Sometimes it's using acronyms, mm -hmm. um, acronyms that they might have been really familiar with as a student. But a few years out, it's taking you a little bit longer to process what that was. Um, so plain language, it, um, there's a uh, the best documentation out there is actually coming out of the UK. 
um, and their government organizations have great plan language documentation. Um, and Sarah Winters is another um, person that I would um, point you to for um, plain language resources. Um, she's got a whole emoji guide. Um, I can send some uh, resources for your show notes. <laughs> um, that will keep me from Googling everything for you right now. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Um, Mike, do you have something for follow-up or should Lexi get back into the next question? Oh, keep going away with questions. We have a slew of them. Love the questions. Thank you awesome. so much. So. Mm -hmm. So next question, Sarah asks, how have you built awareness of what kind of content constitutes will see when they click on the link snack bar? They love the content, just wondering how you built traffic to the site when it's not immediately obvious what kind of content content snack bar will have. Yeah, um, we launched the snack bar on April Fool's Day. Um, and it's... Um, you know, it's named snack bar because it's snackable bite-sized content, which is like, was very trendy in the content strategy world. And we were trying to describe what this thing is. Um, and I wouldn't encourage people to use trendy internal buzzwords for external marketing often, but um, at some point we just decided to run with it and um, use French fries and candy bars and like all of these fun kinds of backgrounds to help us launch it. And then um, when we had the opportunity to launch it on April Fool's Day, um, that kind of helped us make a splash with something that seemed like a joke, um, but was actually something that we thought would be helpful and fun um, to deliver to the audience. Um, and you can see where we decided to rebrand and not put a snack bar on our uh, campaign site, but instead rebrand it as good stories, but the concept remains the same. Um, I would say like all like all of our other content, the primary way that people are getting to it is us pushing them there. Um, and so we're pushing people there in email, um, in social media posts. Um, I don't think we've yet sent anyone to the snack bar directly from text message, um, but mostly email and um, email and social is how they would how they would land there. Um, otherwise it would, there's a very small percentage that come to our website and explore. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some people who are curious, but most of the traffic is landing directly inside the website somewhere. Um, and, uh, some of our most interesting, um, uh, pieces of content we'll put in the snack bar and then point people there. Um, some things that have worked well, um, uh, Recaps. Uh, I think if you're there now, you might have to scroll a little bit at some point, but we um, in June had a reunion. And so there was a whole flood of reunion snacks. And rather than doing a long form article, what happened at reunion? And here's a photo and here's a quote from someone. We did no long form article um, for reunion this year from the alumni team. Um, instead, we did a whole bunch of snacks. And then for our reunion recap, we pointed people to the snack bar. If you want to know what happened, here's all of, all of the things. Um, we also will um, grasp onto like pop culture, um, trending uh, news and events. Um, we tend to have uh, more than a handful of Olympians in the um, summer and winter games. And so um, we know those snacks always perform really well if we can do um, a few of the different Olympians. So it's those kinds of things, you know, things that are, uh, would be popular on social media. And then also thinking about how we can reframe what used to be a standard alumni story, um, and, uh, chunk that out into smaller bite-sized snacks. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I think we have more questions coming in. Um, I know, uh, um, I can see them there. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 hopefully we have time to get to all of them, but Lexi, let's get to the next question. Yeah, Missy says, hi there. Did you have any concerns internally with your move to a more conversational tone? And did you perform any message testing to make sure your audience responded well to it prior to the change? Thanks. I love A-B testing. I'm not sure that if it happened here, but um, I love the idea of it. So. Yeah, um, 
So I'm thinking back to the initial writing workshop that we did with Erica and it was her, she was, so she was the first person to present it to us. And then it was our job to then carry the torch if we thought it was a good idea. And even within our own team, our writers really had a visceral reaction <laughs> to this approach. Um, some of that, like there were, there was uh, elevated voices um, in the room um, uh, pushing back on, on it to start even in our own teams. And so we didn't roll it out across all communication at once. We started in different pockets. Um, and um, one of our favorite places to experiment is with our giving day campaign. Um, from the start, that was a place where we decided we were gonna take a different, have a different tone and it was gonna be more fun than our other communication. And when giving day did well, then, okay, well, that fun tone works. Can we put that fun tone over here now? Can we put it in homecoming? Can we put it in reunion? Can we put it in our newsletter, right? So um, it slowly permeated. Um, there are some places on our website where you see conversational tone. There's a lot of places that you don't. Um, so it hasn't totally penetrated all, all, all copy everywhere. Um, we get direct feedback every time we send an email out. Um, so um, there are folks that really don't appreciate it. Um, and we have to take that in stride. Um, you know, some of our um, older constituents really don't like being called by their first name. Hmm. They're Miss or Mr. So-and-so, and how dare you call me, Ashley. Oh. Um, so we had to make that decision of, you know, are all of these communications going to upset Ashley from here out, or do we change our stance because Ashley doesn't like being called by her first name? Um, and so, um, it's it's challenging um, to uh, to have to make those decisions, um, and I, I know some leadership really um, would rather take the path of least resistance. Um, but we have shown that there are a lot more people who enjoy it than the handful of people that are are truly getting turned off, um, and that and that is a difficult decision to make. So the direct feedback, um, we welcome it. Um, we do try to incorporate what we refer to as self-aware messaging uh, in our newsletters and in our, uh, in our communication back and forth with folks. And so when we try something new, we'll ask for direct feedback. Um, sometimes it's just a, a small statement with a little emoji, thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm. Um, we included student quotes this week. What did you think of the student quotes? And really quick direct feedback from people. Um, and then if they have something to say, we're welcoming that feedback. Um, we have a, a whole separate footer at this point above our standard footer where we tell people why we sent them the communication um, and give them an out. Um, so rather than just then having unsubscribe, change your preferences here, we have a whole footer that's, you know, if this newsletter is too much for you, we understand here's a way to put it on pause for six months. Or if this is now is not a good time to be sending you a giving solicitation, please let us know. Um, we'll opt you out for the next year. You know, those kinds of, it, it, again, it's a different way of thinking about conversation. Um, it's anticipating. Um, my email team lead will uh, will say this. She'll, she anticipates what that first um, inbox message is going to be to her. So when she gets something delivered from the creative group and they said, here, build this email for me, she's sitting then down to anticipate, well, what's the first nasty gram that I'm going to get <laughs> when I send this out? Because someone's going to have feedback, right? And there's, there's a way for us to inject a little bit more self-awareness into the communication. We'll do that because we 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 think it's a valuable part of, of the conversation with the audience. Um, and we see really low unsubscribe rates. Um, and I think that is due in part to us being really clear um, with why the person's getting the communication. You can't make everyone happy all the time, but that's conversational marketing. It is not just about how you write. It's that kind of thinking where the footer you talked about with the 
option to unsubscribe for six months. Like that's conversational marketing. That's anticipating like, you know, maybe people want these messages, but, but maybe they don't, but the way you talk to them could influence them to put things on pause and come back to you later. Um, so many questions. And my favorite one is one away. Um, but there's a great question on policy and um, uh, Lexi's going to set that one up next. Thank you, Greg. Derek wants to know, does your campus have any formalized policy or guidelines about one too many, in parentheses, unsolicited emails to students? They're helping craft theirs now and have been seeing a, lack, a lot of inconsistency there. We have texting policies that we send out on because we, we deal mostly with texting. I know a lot of these questions yeah. might be about emails, but it's really the same principle with that. And we're huge on having a texting policy for your school. So I'd love your thoughts on this. <laughs> so I don't communicate to students. Um, rarely do we communicate directly to students from my division. So I, I think that that is, it, it's a little bit outside my wheelhouse um, to talk about how many messages should go to students and if there should be a policy around it. I imagine there are really good reasons to have that. Um, we don't have a policy similar for the alumni or donor base. Um, and um, I think I mentioned already the the places where I'm tracking, um, you know, we've got kind of we've got standard benchmarks for each of our communications. You know, what do we expect a response rate to be for a text message? What do we expect a click through rate to be for email communication? Um, and these benchmarks that we track every communication that goes out. Um, and the unsubscribe or the opt out is really um, if if something it's so consistent. Those those unsubscribe and out opt out rates are so consistent that if it fluctuates, that's when that's when the flag goes up. What happened? Was this because there was too much communication? Is it because the timing was wrong? Um, has something changed with this channel? Um, and and to go back about what's changed in the pan with the pandemic, I think digital communication habits really did change during that time. Um, more generations became uh, connected to digital communication. So the amount of people that we reach grew that way, uh, just multi-generational. Um, but the frequency and and how we um, how often we check and where we check our email, you know, you're checking it in bed and in the bathroom and while you're eating and all of those things I think really um, became exacerbated during the pandemic when it was um, one of our you know primary communication outlets um, for more um, for more places, you know, you're connecting with more places than you had before through digital only, where you were used to picking up phone calls or you're used to going into offices for, for things. Um, so I do think a lot of that has changed in our, in our metrics uh, and, the, and the volume and everything um, uh, is reflected in that, in that point in time, things really changed. Did I answer the question? I don't remember. You did. Question. You did. Okay, you okay, answered two questions, so. actually. You went okay, above good. and beyond for us. So I, I appreciate that, actually. Lexi, let's get to the one that I couldn't wait to get to. <laughs> right. Greg's itching to answer this question. Michelle asks, what kind of tips would you give for crafting compelling email subject lines? Greg, do you want to tackle it first and then hand it to Ashley once you well, give your answer? I do want to say, and we I have thoughts on this, of course, but like this is the same as, like I said, with the policy, like with texting and email, um, subject lines are my passion. I love the idea of like those first six words and how important because people see that on their phone. Text, it's the same way. You're going to see three or four words right away. Are you going to make those boring like attention or are you actually going to make someone open that so um, I don't want to tackle it I want our expert to tackle it, but I might have thoughts to follow up I can Mike have Mike we, we might have follow up thoughts I don't know but I, I love this um I'm, I'm very passionate about text and subject lines in terms of the preview text so I'm yeah. talking way too much I gotta let Ashley. Know. Um, so a, a couple rules that we follow. Um. Rule number one above all others is that they need to know that it's coming from Cornell University. So um, if the from, so we're gonna, we're tying in from name with subject line at this point. If the sender, if the from name uh, is a person, 
we need to make sure there's like a comma in Cornell University and their, their title related to that person because I will not presume that you know who even the president of our university is. And we make way too many presumptions <laughs> um, with people knowing who's sending them a communication. If, um, if it's not, or if they have a really long name or if the, you know, it's not in the from name then it needs to be in the subject line. Um, Cornell needs to be in there somewhere. So that is the most important somewhere they need to know where the communication is coming from. Um, the next part of it, I think really depends on what the type of communication is. Um, and there are, you know, we've, we've tried, we've tested a lot of things. We AB test almost every time things go out. And I gotta say, um, I think it's due to the consistency um, of our communication that people know what they're getting from us, um, that subject lines don't really throw our stats one way or those A, B, or we just have people writing really great A's and B's because the stats really don't swing one way or another. Um, tried to prove that having first name in the subject line would do something for us and it really didn't. That's um, incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> you know, a first name or like a good pun they're they're performing pretty much just as well um so um i we try to include emojis in our subject lines to catch attention um we try to make it as relevant as possible um we try to put smiles on people's faces um so if it's an engagement piece of any kind um what's going to make someone want to open that um that engagement piece um and um trying to think of some of the other, um, so I do consult with other higher ed institutions and other nonprofits. Um, and what I found through email marketing audits um, recently uh, is just the naming, like um, uh, people might name what is in the email. Um, uh, maybe you have like end of your report, like, hey, we have an end of your report for you. Um, uh, that could be fine for the first time you send that email um, because you want to be clear and you want to be sharing, here's your end of your report. But if you're going to send two or three more follow-up emails about your end of your report and you're not seeing the opens that you want, um, you got to change <laughs> the title from being end of your report every time. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a nuanced, It's I think that's a challenging nuanced question. I think, um, my, you know, what I would tell a new email subject line writer is to kind of go with what you would send to another person. If you were going to send this to a friend that, you know, if you have another student or you have an alum in mind that you know is going to get this, how would you write it to that person? How would they know to open it up? Like, what are you excited about that's in that email to share? Make that your lead, make that your, your opening. What um, if you don't have any friends? Yeah, you got an imaginary friend persona um, in your audience, but but yeah, thinking about um, because I think that brings it back to the subject line feeling authentic. Um, if you can if you can put someone in your mind that's going to get that, and you know it's going to make sense to them, and you know they understand the voice, um, that's when I think it works. Very cool, Mike. I don't even know if we have time. Do you have four more hours? It Actually, feels uh, like we need just we need to extend you know. this episode. We need a, like a part two. We can do part know. two. Yeah, maybe we do a part two. I and I don't even know. I don't think um Lexi will tell me. Lexi's in charge, um, so she's going to tell me. I don't know that we have time for one more question or um or not, Lexi. Yeah, I think we can squeeze one more question in here. One more question. Um, yes. So Susan agreed with you when you were talking about frequency and multiple touch points for communication. Mm -hmm. um, they say that their system bumps people if they receive too many emails in that week. Do, what would be your recommendation with that? Take that toggle off, whatever is filtering that. Um, yeah, someone must have set up a rule. Um, I think, and if you are challenged to um, yeah, someone's saying, yeah, it is. Um, so if, if you're challenged with having to push back on that role someone established that role, 
maybe years and years ago, um, talking about how behaviors have changed. Um, um, if, if people want to be receiving commun multiple communications from you, then you gotta open it up. Um, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say other than um, asking for it to maybe be stretched a little bit farther because you're seeing a, a significant amount of people hit that threshold. Um, uh, let me just share a couple other things that we're tracking. Um, so we do track um, both text message responses and um, email click-throughs as part of engagement with our audience. And we wanna know who our most engaged people are. And if you're reading and clicking through five or more unique emails with the institution with us, we're, we're considering you a pretty engaged person. Um, if you're responding to our text messages, if you're liking a bunch of content on Facebook, all of these things um, are really important touch points to know how active the audience is and, and what they're paying attention to. And it doesn't mean that they're showing up to your events. You know, It doesn't mean that they're making donations. There's all these other ways that they're showing us that they're interested and that they are, they do know what's happening. And so, um, so really treating these communication channels as engagement offers, I think will help change the um, change that part of the conversation. Um, I don't know what else I can say about that, but yeah, I'm happy to do a part two. If we have more, I mean, we'll just make it a Q and A though. We're gonna <laughs> make it a series. Don't make me press. Yes. <laughs> This is wild. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for joining. If um, if anybody wanted to condense this down to 90 seconds, let's say, what would be the key takeaways and, and actual items you'd want them to leave with today? Um, I would say um, thinking about that trust triangle that I described, authenticity, empathy, and logic. Um, when when you're crafting your communication with those three things in mind, you will build trust with your audience. Um, they will hang out with you for longer. Um, the frequency I think is so interesting. And if you're the type of institution that is just sending one email communication for one thing, um, you know, like, okay, we sent it to them. They must have received it. Um, time to start re rethinking that, um, that what used to be one email communication might now need to be three or four or five, um, because people's habits have changed. They're used to being prompted and reminded. Um, and, um, I'll just share one more anecdote. Um, we sent out, a email, um, it was a solicitation at the end of the year, this year to a group of really unengaged people, but we had we had a gimmick. We had something that we thought would get these unengaged people um, to pay attention. And email one got maybe 13 people to pay attention. Email two, closer to 40. Email three, 90 more. Mm -hmm. um, and we only had three planned, but I really wanted to see if it would like, was three the peak? Um, was it not? And so these are the kinds of things that I think we can, we can test in, in trying to understand frequency. Um, how many communications does it take to really get the audience to do to take the action, um, and um, because of the way even big brands are handling volume of email communication, um, we need to think about upping the volume too. Very good. Well, on that note, Ashley, again, thank you so much. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, Ashley Dot at Cornell Edu, right? Yeah, and uh, I do share a lot of the projects that I work on and the articles that I'm reading um, in my newsletter, and that's at AshleyBud.com. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining, Ashley. Greg, any final thoughts? No, no. Just remember that this uh, episode of FYI was brought to you by Mongoose. We make a uh, higher ed premier engagement platform cadence. Um, and thank you so much for all the comments and questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to you. Right. Um, I know Andy shared that great link to subject lines. Check that out in the chat before it goes away. Andy is always, uh, he's like the best friend of the FYI. Um, but uh, Mike, we're getting stickers in, I believe. For yes. The yeah, so we'll have some reciprocal gifts to give out to our friends, so we don't want you to miss out on that. And speaking of not missing out, our next episode is uh, July 19th. I had to look at the dates again. Um, and that is with uh, Luis Diaz, who is recently joining Alma Base. Uh, Ashley, you know uh, Luis, I think, right? I think you've crossed paths, yeah. Um, so we'll talk about donor participation. I believe the title he's said is the 
renewable revenue machine for institutions, which I thought was kind of cool. We'll so have to we'll put see an where Lewis goes with that. What's that? We'll have to put an emoji into that title to draw. I think a cog in a wheel, cog although people don't want to be wheels, you know, typically. But on that note, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We'll have this recording out to you. Ashley, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you.